good afternoon everyone uh, as uh, all we are here just just to discuss about uh, some critical care programs and some critical care uh, structured educations uh, so we are here uh, we are uh, we are having uh, today dr bojendra lakar uh, he is the director of critical care medicine cell city hospital guwahati so what we will discuss about today about the arterial and central venous line which is all we know that it is uh, almost a brain and butter and almost we do every now and then in our critical care days so any patient who comes in uh, critical care who is immunodynamically unstable like that means the patients who doesn't have a normal blood pressure so the patients who need a fluid we really do not understand what is going on and how we go about what amount of the fluids that we need to give why we need to stop the fluid or reduce of the uh, the rate of fluids so that need to be monitored now for the monitoring we need to have some access to the body from where we can access to the monitor and we can regulate our uh, treatment uh, for that particular critically ill patients now having said that there are some pros and cons of having a central venous line because all we know but many years back in the central venous line which was uh, the ultimate uh, the surrogate marker of uh, the volume that the patients have but yes the central venous line and the central venous pressure that has a lot of problems of understanding about the body fluid so we are now measuring the central venous pressure every now and then but yes the central venous line is required many times just for different reasons like we need to give some fluids we need to give some medications which we cannot give very thoroughly and the central venous line also give the access to the near to the heart and even uh, we do almost all of you agree that even sometimes we need to uh, change the central venous line with the central venous uh, dialysis catheter on a daily road sometimes a patient who is really bad and need some uh, hemodynamic uh, support especially the dialysis support so uh, central venous line is yes it is required till now but yes the central venous pressure is probably not the very ideal one right now it is and the arterial line if we look at it very clearly any patient who needs any vasopressor support for maintaining the blood pressure we must have the arterial line because the patients who are hypotensive they usually do not have the non invasive uh, blood pressure monitoring which is a uh, 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 ultimate one so basically to have a minute to minute pressure which is very important to adjust and to titrate the uh, pressure agent uh, we need the arterial lines so if we look at the arterial line and central venous line these are two different uh, uh, things but at the same time the arterial line which access the arterial side of the body and the central venous line which is access towards the central the venous venous uh, side of the body and ultimately one of the most important factors that we need to take care of all these things is the prevention of infections and the take care of the line very nice so uh, i am handed over the sessions to dr lahakar uh, who will speak on uh, the arterial line and the central venous line their nursing uh, care and the interpretations of the tracing which are very important for all of us to understand and understand rightly so that we could not misunderstand and that will misguide the treatment that is very important many a times we just go on without uh, neutralizing or without any uh, corrections of the arterial line or any uh, zeroing without doing a zeroing we just go on treating the uh, the blood pressure which is showing on the monitors and it ultimately we have seen many times that the patient blood pressure is 100 by 110 and it monitor is showing 80 by 10 80 by 60 and the, we are all increasing the non at the mass patient supports so these are few things which we need to know and uh, this will make our life more easy this will uh, make the patients more safe and we all need to understand about the safety in icu is most important and the understanding and the knowledge which is most required to give the best outcome to all the patients which will be attending in the critical care area. so i hand it over to uh, dr leka and in between if there is any question please raise your hand uh, put the question since we are all here and the end of the sessions we will discuss and anything and whatever in your mind please speak out so that we can discuss these are the platforms where we can exchange our views even it is a platform where even the unknown things also been propped up and we can carry forward
tomorrow at 10 who I will with our next session thank you dr lerka please Yes. I would just request the participants that if they have any questions, to so please put it in the chat box so that sir can take the questions at the end of the session. Thank you, Dr. Saha. Am I audible? Yeah, yes, yeah, you are audible. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Dr. Saha, for the introduction, and uh, thank you, thank all the participants for uh, this session and for coming to this session. I'm sharing my slide now. Yes, sir. You can share. Is it visible? Is it visible? Yes, yes, it, yes, is, sir, visible. Yes, it is visible. Okay. So, good evening, everybody. Mm, all the participants. I I am supposed to speak on arterial line and central venous line, nursing care, and interpretation of dressings, and and just. As like any other discussion, we, we always try to correlate our discussion surrounding a patient because uh, that way actually we can visualize where, where we stand actually. Just this case, actually everyone is uh, having this experience like 56 years old, diabetic, hypertensive, presented with fever and cough for five days, breathlessness for three days, ultra sensitive for one day. And when he presented to AR or emergency department, his heart rate was very high, 136. He was in SOG, BP 60 by 40. He was tachypneic, respiratory rate was 46. Crackles bilaterally, a patient was almost unresponsive. He was intubated and ventilated in A&E. Fluid given through femoral lines given urgently because all the peripheral venous access were difficult. Blood gases and other investigations sent from the emergency department and including lactates. Then antibiotics started, vasopressors started and shifted to medical ICU. So this is a situation where probably we all deal with day in and day out. Probably we all deal with this type of patient every almost every day. So when we discuss about central line, probably the central line was given in the in the emergency department itself. So let us discuss about central lines first. The central venous catheter insertion in the human being was first reported in 1929, and 8% of hospitalized patients actually need central venous access. And over the last almost 100 years, the development is tremendous and the type of catheters and type of care we give, care we take, so these are tremendous. Then, then central venous pressure is considered a direct measurement of blood pressure in the right atrium and vena cava. So uh, this also have some caveats like it's not always true, but still in, in general terms, it's, it's the direct measurement of the pressure in the right atrium and vena cava. It reflects the patient's cardiac function, venous return to the heart. So all the blood from the upper part of the body and lower part of the body that, that comes to the right atrium. And this will give you a surrogate value uh, to the, the central venous pressure will give a surrogate value to the right atrial pressure unless the, there is defect in the, in the valve. The right ventricle function also, this may give some idea about the function. Then intravascular fluid volume status, though it cannot give you fluid overload status correctly, but it's, it's fairly good to predict the uh, hypovolemic state, in fact. The central venous catheter also facilitates rapid and high volume fluid and concentrated drug admission. These are the uh, areas probably where central venous catheter is given in, in a very urgent situation in emergency. Let us discuss about indications in a methodical way. So whenever we have inadequate peripheral venous access, like the patient we have discussed already. So there, the central venous axis will give us a very good big vessels where we can infuse a lot of, lot of uh, fluids, including sometimes uh, blood. Then peripherally incompatible infusions. Suppose if we give a very concentrated drugs, like uh, noradrenaline for that matter, vasopressors in, in very high concentrated uh, way. So that has to be infused through central vein. There are a lot of chemotherapeutic agents which cannot be uh, infused through peripheral veins. There are a lot of reactions to the, to the peripheral vein. That's why these incompatible infusions and like and total parental nutrition also cannot be infused through peripheral vein, though there are some peripherally uh, infusible in nutrition is there still. Where peripherally incompatible, uh, incompatible infusions would be uh, actually transfused through central venous then. 
Hemodynamic monitoring is next point. So we, we can have access to the right atrial pressure and central venous pressure will uh, definitely guide us. Then extracorporeal therapies, we know that in renal replacement therapy for hemodialysis, they may, you may put a catheter jugular line, triple lumen, and which where we can place that or in a tunnel lumen also, which I'll come to that later on. And that can be kept for longer time, long time, and the dialysis can be done through those lines. Uh, like ECMO, where the lines are put in a very big veins, and, and ECMO is one which is coming in a big vein in the last COVID situations. Probably most of the hospitals uh, in a big cities they are doing this for venous interventions as well as the placement of other medical devices like venacapa filters. Many a time, DVT repeated repeated deep vein thrombosis. We have to put uh, venacapa filters to prevent uh, pulmonary thromboembolysis so that the deep the clots doesn't move from the deep vein in the legs to the lungs and causing very serious problem. Like pacemaker and ICD implantation also, we can think about uh, putting a pacemaker, which is also actually the accessory, access is actually central venous line. And we can think about a pacemaker and implantable defibrillator also can be placed the way and the methods are similar. This has to be placed through a central uh, venous line. The PA catheter placement, though it's a pulmonary artery, the, the placement has to be uh, through the vein. So this is again uh, one way of putting a central line, central venous access. So these are indications and there are relative contraindications. So there's no absolute contraindication as such, if, if, if I can remember, because uh, in, a, in a major life-threatening situation where you have to give fluid or maybe medicine through lines and even you're not getting any, any peripheral line, you'll have to give access to, a, to the veins and central line is the only thing probably that will save Many times we think that, okay, platelet count is very low, maybe 50,000 or 30,000 patients will bleed to death. But again, the, the incidence of major bleeding is in less than 1%. So if, even if in a coagulopathy patient, if the platelet count is above 20,000 or INR is uh, less than three, then we don't uh, think we can give, but the component transmission is indicated if platelet count is less than 20,000 or INR is more than three. So even if patient is having risk of bleeding or coagulopathy or thrombocytopenia, if the patient needs the central access urgently, it has to be given. There are site-specific relative contraindications like their anatomic dis distortion. Suppose someone is having a uh, limb uh, burn all, of, all over the body and um, the, the fractured limb and you cannot access the, those limbs. There are some anatomic uh, distortion may also, uh, actually, uh, this is also relative contraindication. Then indwelling intravascular hardware like pacemaker, hemodialysis catheter is already placed. Those are relative contraindications. Where to place? There are some areas where the infection rates are much higher. So these, these areas will be contraindicated. There are different types of uh, central lines like uh, single lumen, double lumen, triple lumen, and then, then the catheters where probably dialysis can be done. And all the lumens can be used for different purposes. The, the lumens are different and tracks are different. Different types of like one can be used for, for TP and another, other can be used for medications. So that's why, uh, and one can be used for central venous pressure monitoring. So these are the types of lumen. Again, if you, th if you see the type of uh, catheter, one can be placed non-tunnel where we use mostly in ICU this non-tunnel catheter where it is directly uh, through the skin, through directly placed at the jugular or subclavian area. I'll come to that, the areas where you can put, or it can be a tunnel catheter where the entry point is distant from the vein. Entry point is distant from the vein, and they, this actually prevent a lot of infection. This catheter can be kept for longer time, long, long time. And like this one also, subcutaneous port is there so that the injection can be given in this type of, like in many patients where long-term chemotherapy is being given for uh, months together. And this can be uh, placed uh, in that area and this can be kept, kept for longer time. And the infection rates are also much less because the colonize occur here. And if you see the infection uh, going on in the skin area, integrity is lost probably you can prevent going and uh, going into deep inside the venous system. So these are the types just to mention there are other things also, but these are the types grossly we can think about in, in central venous canal.
So coming to how to set up central lines, uh, first comes the equipments. What are the equipments actually? I'll, I'll give you the start. Like you, everyone is probably whoever is being in ICU know that uh, chlor two percent uh, chlorhexidine skin preparation solution, sterile gown, gauze paste, sterile drabs. These are all required for local anesthesia. You need something needle 25 gauge, and then lock system, then secret needle, introduction needle. Guideway, transducer, catheter, trans transaction kit, tubing, tissue dilator, everything. So this is actually then sutures because you'll have to place the catheter and fix it so that it doesn't move out or move down. And sterile dressing is also important. So equipment, this is, these are the list and you must have a cross check before you actually go into game or assist in, in giving central line. So important things needed to monitor pressure actually is pressure bag, disposal pressure tubing, transducer cable, transducer holder, and transducer itself. So these actually come, come into a package and why this is important, we must maintain a pressure bag, uh, which is usually maintained around 300 millimeter mercury. Then pressure bag goes you have to measure the pressure level this transducer actually uh, have few components like one is transducer holder. It can hold the main transducer, calibration button is there. Fast flush device, I'll come to that later on when we discuss about what is fast flush or a square test, uh, test. Then this, this transducer should be placed in a way, I'll come to that way to place in a in hard body situation, uh, position it, it is actually maintained. So, the preparation for, for nursing point, it's important if you like, you have to take the consent, informed consent, and patient must be monitored, like cardiac ECG monitoring should be there, and then SPO2 should be main monitored, and oxygen support if needed should be in hand in ICU. Then patient positioning is also important, and in what position patient is comfortable. The bed position is also important. The uh, doctor or technician will be giving this also actually the weight patient should be high enough so that the patient has to, the the person who is giving the center line uh, should not bend forward too much and he should be comfortable and in that position this this should be a sterile technique and side preparation is extremely important and chlorhexidine based solution is, is is better than other solution so povidone is actually better than povidone iron solution and you should stick to this Sedation and analysis, yeah, many times patient may be very, very um, anxious, actually patient may be unconscious, patient unresponsive or restless fighting. So you, you have to uh, follow a sedation and analysis protocol and just to maintain uh, correct position and so that we don't injure the patient and we, we can get in the minimum effort, minimum uh, attempt actually. If, if we increase the attempt number, the chance of complications are higher, that has been proved. So once the catheter is placed, because the, the method and techniques of putting a catheter are, are different, and this is not the scope of this discussion in the nursing care, so, so that is a hands-on trend. So catheter, once the catheter is placed, what next actually? With the next, uh, the aftercare is extremely important. The sterile, transparent, semi-permeable dressing is, is, is one thing, you must keep it um, correctly so that the the entry point, entry point should be clearly visible, and any uh, in a loss of integrity, any bleeding there, or um, any bogginess or any um, redness in pleasing color changes, we must observe every day, so that the sterile, transparent, semi-permeable dressing is the best thing to follow. In non-tunnel central line, we actually. Uh, actually, it's advocated that every two days the gauze dressing, for gauze dressing every two days the dressing is changed, but for transparent dressing, uh, where most of the times we use transparent dressing, every seven days this has to be changed and see. Or tunnel central lines, transparent dressings to be replaced no more than once in a week till the incessant sign has healed. Okay, once the, once the incessant sign has healed, also, actually it should be observed and healed uh, as per requirement only. All soiled and loose dressings should be replaced early. So any soiled or if integrity is lost, if it is loose, and then it should be as uh, dressing should be replaced as, as early as possible.
the chlorhexidine exit site spawns actually this is one thing where uh, it was on bog for use for many uh, time, long time and and it has it has shown some benefit in preventing preventing infection uh, or central line associated infection bloodstream infection but again uh, with the improve in the in the management or care of the central line actually the need for diesel also decreased and 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 people are actually um, uh, the, the studies recent studies are also showing that the this actually the the incidence of infection or colonizing inside the catheter or crbsa incidences are similar when whether we use chlorhexidine in exit site spawns or not topical antibiotic again questionable and but it is it is not routinely advocated to to use actually just after putting the central line, we must confirm the catheter tip position. And the best way in the nice view is to do an X-ray, and it, it can be done by ultrasonography also or echocardiography in in a situation when it's needed. If, if central line is being used, used uh, for pulmonary arterial catheterization, probably equal and other things will be. Uh, sometimes it's necessary, but many most of the time probably a. A plain X-ray will tell you where the catheter tip is here, and also will give you other, like this intubated patient. You can see the tube position along with the tip of the catheter, central line catheter, central venous catheter. This is extremely important because, again, again, the the complications also can be picked up if if you have developed small pneumothorax somewhere here, or may some bleed, suppose hemorrhage, hema. Hemothorax has already occurred, probably X-ray may pick up the early findings here. And that's why they're doing an X-ray is an, an important point, just to confirm the catheter tip. And, but in femoral, femoral uh, lines, femoral venous lines actually is not routinely advised to do X-rays of the abdomen. So aftercare and access point management is also important. The contaminated need needless uh, connectors, then catheter halves or injection ports are recognized source of infection. So anything which is not required, not the suppose lines or connect connectors or tubes not being used should be closed tightly. Then wiping the access port with an appropriate antiseptic is also extremely important to prevent infection. Access the port only with sterile devices. So once we disconnect and use something, we connect the device, we'll that the device has to be a sterile. For injection port, if we want to inject something through that port, clean the access port with 70% alcohol or either for before accessing the system. That is also every time we uh, inject something, this has to be clean. Cap all stopcocks when it's not in use. That, that is also an important point. Uh, and these, these four points are extremely important to prevent uh, see a catheter related bloodstream infection. Next important point is zeroing. A lot of discussions has been on, on zeroing. What is actually zeroing? The zeroing is that when we put the transducer in, in a position away from the heart, maybe somewhere high up or low, then the right atrial area, the pressure in the, in the monitor will be shown as a different pressure. So I'll come to that. Like the the patient head position is also important. So we follow the flavostatic axis is extremely important here. And what is flavostatic axis is if we measure in the fourth intercostal space in the mid axillary line, this is the actually flavostatic axis point where it, it corresponds to the atrial, right atrial pressure, right atrial level. And irrespective of the patient's position, if the patient head is high up like this, if this point has gone up, the transducer point should be here. So here, patient is in supine position. That's why in supine position, the, the, transducer, uh, the uh, transducer should be in the, in the same line, along with this line, flavostatic axis, flavostatic line. In the, it's in the mid axillary line. It's in the fourth intercostal space. And, and this is in the area where the probably right, right, right atrial pressure lies. So if the patient is in the, in the suppose 45 degree incline, the head up position, then also this, this, uh, this transducer position should be up somewhere here. And if we don't do that, probably pressure measurements will be wrong. So like this, this one, in, 
if we if we want to do zero actually what is the zeroing actually if if we do not maintain this level if we see the phlebostatic axis this should be a zero level and beyond this only the pressure will be maintained if the transducer is somewhere up here the zeroing will be somewhere here that's why when we zero it out we check the system and it is exposed to the air actually the what we do actually we open the stopcock on transducer to the port or air so that the, it is exposed to the air and the flask will remove the dead end cap activate the flask drive because we have already shown you that the flask the fluid uh, 500 ml saline which will be under pressure around 300 milliliter mercury so that fluid will be passed through immediately and that will that will be exposed to the the whole system will be exposed to the high pressure and and the air uh, once they activate the flush they press the zero button on the bedside monitor and this will read zero so the position of the that means it will neutralize the atmospheric pressure and from that point on only it will read the actual pressure value inside the system the hold down the 100 millimeter mercury calibration button to eliminate drift drift so that will again read 100 so return the stop back, back to port or monitoring position so that the, and then replace the dead end cap and this dead end cap will uh, if we if we remove it it will expose the whole system to the air and it will just uh, uh, give a zero pressure nullifying the air atmospheric pressure so what is the what is the cvp actually once you measure cvp is uh, 2 to 6 millimeter mercury or 4 to 12 centimeter mercury uh, centimeter of water and the right atrial pressure and this is actually increased in fluid overload the right heart failure cardiac tamponade pleural effusion tension anything which will increase the pressure inside thorax will probably increase the pressure in the in the central venous system and even fluid overload but fluid overload status can be mistaken if someone is having heart failure we cannot predict that the person is having fluid overload based on central venous pressure this is the fallacy so though Previously, uh, many a times CVP central venous pressure has been used to determine the fluid status in the body. But this is fallacy because there are a lot of other things which can actually uh, mistakenly say that the patient might be fluid overload. And why, uh, when it is decreased, it is shock, hypovolemic shock, and forced inhalation. Like in hypovolemia, this is more sensitive because uh, CVP nowadays we don't much use to determine fluid overload but if cvp is low in 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 an emergency department probably that is one point we should uh, consider to give more fluid sub, fluid bolus or maybe fluid challenge we can fluid bolus we can try uh, depending on the very low cvp so when we discuss about uh, pressing what are the waveform central venous waveform when we connect to the connector if you see, you will see a waves like this okay there are three positive waves okay three positive waves. this is a wave the small c wave then this is x descent and this is v v wave and y descent everyone is correlated with the cardiac function cardiac cycle i'll come to that and if you compare with the with the ecg the a wave comes with the okay if you come to here the a wave comes at the time where atrium is contracting if you if you remember remember the cardiac cycle the blood from the right atrium goes into the right ventricle so it is right atrium and this is right ventricle and through in superior vena cava and inferior vena cava blood is coming to the right atrium and it is filled and then the ventricle will pump the blood to the pulmonary artery again the valves tricuspid valve will close and the blood will be full and ultimately the tricuspid valve will open the blood will go to the right ventricle again so this is reflected in the in the central venous stressing okay because this is the late uh, diastole in the late diastole when when uh, atrium actually contract the this is also called atrial kick the atrium contract the the blood from the atrium will be pushed to the right ventricle and this atrial kick will be reflected here by a big wave like this one a wave because atrium atrial pressure will be high uh, 
which will be reflected into the central venous line. And once this, this is off, this is almost finished, then the tricuspid valve will be closed. And this is called C positive wave because of the valve closure, this will be reflected upon as a positive curve and this will be shown as a C cusp. And then the descent is that the pressure will be relaxed in the right atrium. So that the next phase, slowly the right atrial filling will be there. The blood will be coming to the right atrium slowly. Then the pressure inside the right atrium will also gradually go up. And this is called the, the v, v wave. And after that, after a wide descent, and again the blood will be going to the ventricle when the tricuspid valve opens and the, the pressure drops from here. So this is in cardiac cycle, the whole waves will be reflected in, in, in a in, uh, atrial dressing, or rather central venous wave form. And see, suppose, suppose your atrial pressure becomes very high. Suppose your, uh, the ventricle during, suppose the v, v waves is very high. During the ventricular contraction, the blood goes through the right ventricle to the pulmonary artery, and the tricuspid valve remains open. Okay, this, this pressure, sorry, this pressure will not be reflected to the right atrium. Imagine a situation where the tricuspid valve is defective and the whole pressure of the right ventricle will be reflected to the right atrium. This V wave will be very big. This ventricular wave will be very big. But looking at this big V wave, you can predict without even examining the patient, probably this person is having something wrong in the tricuspid valve where ventricular pressure has been reflected to the uh, atrial pressure. So this way, again, in atrial, suppose the tricuspid, say, stenosis or something is wrong in the, uh, the blood cannot be pushed to the right ventricle because of some reason, or maybe uh, hypertension, right, right heart uh, hypertension, then probably right atrial pressure force may be higher. It has to push blood more forcefully. The A wave may be bigger way. way. Or if, if the, uh, tricuspid valve actually closes or stenosis, the, the whole pressure will be reflected to the atrium, to the central venous line, causing a big A wave. So that's why the, so from this actually uh, dressing, if you observe this dressing in your monitor, um, you can actually predict. But most, pro most commonly what we do is the pressure level, what is the central venous pressure range. The configuration, many a time we don't notice, but configurations are also important. Again, that is also beyond the scope of this discussion because this itself is a big topic, configurations of all the waveforms and some, some of the defective waveforms. So it should be remembered that CVP measurement is the mean of the A wave, okay? The mean of the A wave is the measurement, but many a time when the, uh, the ventricular wave may be defective, that is also the configuration will be changed and you can actually predict from the monitor. If you come back to the case, actually, this case actually uh, was on central line and BP is still not maintained, still in SOR, needing high dose of pressure pressure, what next? And probably he will need an arterial line to monitor arterial pressure to uh, be effectively titrate the uh, vasopressures. Maybe patient is on NORA and vasopressure, so what next? Maybe our target may be different. NIBP, non-invasive blood pressure monitoring is not that reliable because peripheral circulation is not that good. Lactates are high maybe. So you are not relying on the peripheral uh, non-invasive analysis. So we may decide to put this arterial line. If you see the arterial line system, there are certain things may be similar to central venous line also. And these are the pressure bag. Uh, you'll have to monitor, see the pressure level easily maintained at 300. And the pressure transducer is there. It is connected to a monitor where the tracing of the arterial pulse wave will be there. And it is connected to the artery. And this is a short, stiff line. And this is saline field non-compressible tipping. So that the any pulsation in the arterial wall has to be reflected into the transducer. And why it is very thick and non-compressible is that you should not, the wave actually, uh, the oscillation is actually, oscillatory movement actually is reflected into the electrical energy to put a, a lines or waves like in the monitor. This oscillation will not be reflected if it is elastic type. 
or uh, then probably the oscillation will be modified to get the actual value here. So if it is non-compressible, whatever the pulsation or oscillation here in the arterial point, so this will be actually reflected here and will be taken up by monitor to show you almost near uh, near accurate uh, values. So that's why this is the roughly arterial line. You you may have uh, I, I'll come to the the things needed for arterial line. Use and benefits uh, like continuous monitoring of accurate blood pressure, okay, real time reading of systolic blood pressure, diastolic blood pressure, mean arterial pressure, and that you can titrate medications correctly. And it's it's much more accurate than and non uh, blood pressure monitoring. And you bit by bit, actually, we can we can say that the blood pressure, what is the blood pressure level exactly at this moment and after five minutes, without putting the discomfort, putting the uh, NIVP cuff for longer time, um, inflating up to around 200 milliliter of mercury and deflating. So even you can you may see you have probably seen many patients with long term 15 minutes interval uh, NIVP measurement causing a lot of uh, the the lesions in the arm you, you have probably observed in many patients. Identification of abnormal arterial waveforms are also important. Evolution of waveforms to predict fluid responsiveness again. Then that is also a, a advanced monitoring. We can we can come to that. And frequent blood sampling. You can imagine a patient where if we want to do blood gas every six hours or four hours even, we have to poke the patient artery for every time. And every time we are putting the patient at risk of having infection, risk of having hematoma, risk of having bleed, risk of having aneurysm. So these are the uh, this can be prevented if you have put on a line, and we can check the ABG more frequently and and titrate our treatment accordingly. There are contraindications like local infection. If you have distortion in anatomy, thrombus at the proposed transfer side, we cannot give severe peripheral vascular disease. We're putting a cannula inside the artery is very difficult or dangerous. Renal disease, the vessels may go into spasm. Supratherapeutic coagulopathy and infusion of thrombolytic agents also is a real contraindication. If coagulopathy is there, probably we should avoid. It's unlike central venous uh, line, uh, we, we may avoid this because what we need, so we don't have to inject anything through this line. This is only to monitor the pressure. It should be remembered. This is to monitor. You are not going to inject any medicine through arterial line. This is extremely important. So. Putting an arterial line, an arterial line rather, um, is not that it's, it's, it's a must, okay? So we need that to decide on medication, titrating the doses, to decide on the, uh, the pressure level and some configuration and to decide on our therapeutic intervention. But in central venous line, this may be life-saving. This is life-saving. For therapy, you need to give bolus fluid. If you don't get any peripheral access, this is extremely important. So site selection is also important. Most commonly we use radial artery. These are again peripheral uh, lines, radial artery, then dorsal spades and brachial arteries, but most commonly radial arteries are we, this is, these are all peripheral arteries. Also central arteries can be used like femoral artery and axillary artery in children. Uh, they're using uh, mostly femoral or dorsal spades. The anatomy of radial artery, because this is commonly used, we should discuss. The radial artery, you should remember, again, ulnar artery. The, the, this is arch, actually, this is called, uh, this arch uh, has got a lot of collaterals. So if you block this artery, why radial artery is commonly used? Because if we block this artery, radial artery, the ulnar artery has got very good collaterals to cover and supply the whole hand. Suppose if we do something wrong here and this artery is blocked or damaged or clogged, then the ulnar artery will save the limb. That's why probably radial artery is being used. And second thing is it's, it's against the bone. So we have a very bag, good background on the bone so that the artery is placed over the bone and it can be fixed and we can put the in very superficial, we can put the line and the bleeding it can be very easily stopped. The, it's a very easily compressible area. But all the vessels, everyone's vessels may not be same. Some people may have a, a difficult uh, or defective uh, collateral. So we have to check that 
we are not putting the that person in danger of just uh, monitoring certain uh, certain values okay just monitoring certain values we cannot put this person's hand in danger or life in danger so that's why this modified allen test is important what uh, what is done actually you uh, we ask the person to pinch the fist and close both radial and ulnar arteries both with both hand then you straighten the limb you have closed that close that one that means once we close ulnar and radial artery compress that the venous drainage will be there all the blood will be drained from the uh, hand and we have will straighten the limb and then we'll release it we'll see the we'll ask the person to open the uh, hand and this will be pale actually this looks pale and you release the ulnar artery and wait for six seconds it takes six seconds to get the color back the color will become normal so that it's it's good and the color is still good no no risk so once we know this is called modified allen test but there is another test like once you know modified allen test what is allen test is that you check both way, not only the ulnar in the next time you do the radial side again the color change you can appreciate here how the color changes once within six minutes the color should be coming back to the normal so once we select the side and mostly we do in the radial artery the color duplex study also you can do ultrasonography you can be used and we can use photoplethysmography and immobilization is also important like hand is good if you can put a artery line in the femoral artery the immobilization part is extremely difficult the limb has to be fixed we cannot flex the limb and physiotherapy and other and uh, things can be difficult in this and that's a site selection that point also comes into uh, consideration so how to set up the artery line i'll just ask the basic actually we can discuss any time later so these are the actually uh, things needed intervascular catheter guide wire lidocaine solution suture material all things like monitoring what we need a, a fluid fill non compliant tubing with stopper transducer dome constant flush device but coming to this and this is important the transducer and we must understand this point and this is the connector where uh, arterial catheter is connected this is the stop cock and this is a flush uh, knob and and this is the stiff uh, line actually that to the saline bag this is go to the 300 500 cc 300 uh, saline bag where is kept under uh, almost 300 mm mercury pressure and this will go to the monitor and when you place the whole thing again remember the syringe where we put it if you want to draw blood here it should be upright syringe should be upright and second is the uh, monitor cable should be downwards and the catheter line should be upward upward and remember there are different varieties where stop cock will be close to the direction of the knob and you must be sure that in this device if we move this this way probably this will close this way if you move this way this will close to the catheter so which way the knob will close you must check before you put the put the line and this is important for flash test okay the cannulation is done cannulation methods and everything is beyond the scope of this discussion again again this needs a hands on training uh, there are two types the angulation is important if you go through a train through the artery the angulation should be different okay so that I'm, i'll not discuss now this is beyond the scope again and what are the complications actually we must know the complication pain and swelling for all all side there may be thrombosis there may be embolization to the distal to the part causing there may be hematoma there will limb ischemia there may pseudo aneurysm this is also again if we have repeated puncture and if we poke the artery repeatedly then probably pseudo aneurysm possibility is high and and then diagnostic blood loss arteriovenous fistula then infection for radial artery cerebral embolization is also important this is also important and we mostly are embolism and peripheral neuropathy if we, if we disturb the nerve probably neuropathy may be there in femoral line femoral lateral cannulation there will be retroperitoneal hematoma and axillary artery there will be cerebral embolization why cerebral embolization because air moves upward actually Uh, even if the direction of blood flow is in the, the, the distal side the air will move up so uh, against the flow 
and it will go to the cerebral area and cerebral circulation will be blocked by air. So brachial plaques will be here again if we disturb or poke the nerves. Then there is cerebral embolism again in brachiality. If you see the upper limbs, all the upper limbs, the risk of cerebral embolism is high. And again, median nerves. So these are all site specific, but generalized is bleeding, in thrombosis, embolation, swelling, infection. These are and embolation to be still even brain are important. These are the things we must remember and we must observe every shift actually. The same thing is when the incidence is not that high, but the clinically significant complications are less than 5%. But again, number of times we, we give a, a catheter in, in ICUs, and this may be a big number over over time. Okay, the number, number of cases, if you are we give more, then probably number will be high. So monitors again, the basic values what we measure is systolic, diastolic, mean arterial pressure, and heart rate. And advanced values like in flow track for cardiac monitoring, output monitoring, this is again, uh, we don't we'll discuss, it will look like this, which will give you as a cardiac uh, output event, cardiac index, uh, which will be again, useful in, in monitoring and, and treatment decisions in many cases. But mostly what we do, we see mean arterial pressure, systolic, diastolic, and heart rate. Arterial pressure tracing also we say. Extremely important for uh, for all, all all staff is the setting up uh, the alarms in the beginning. You don't let the alarm go off every now and then unnecessarily. So what is the limit you will set? What is the limit of alarm set is extremely important. Every shift when you take the case, uh, hand over the case, you, you check the alarm, alarm level and so, so that you should not have alarm fatigue. Okay, review alarms in the beginning of every shift and give appropriate warning for, because the alarm fatigue will actually, uh, will not be able to intervene if, a, or just before the cardiovascular collapse and even bleeding. See, if, if the connection is dis, disclosed unknowingly and the hands are inside bed seat, patient may bleed to death. If, if nighttime, night shift person is, and if, we, if alarm is shut off or we are not, listening to the alarm because of alarm fatigue and patient may have extremely extreme, uh, high amount of bleeding and leading to death that's that's uh, very important zeroing is also important i'm i'm repeating the same point because this is again phlebostatic axis where fourth intercostal space okay fourth intercostal space mid axillary line mid axillary line that is the phlebostatic point where the transducer will be there so that the we will zeroing it how to zero it the flush the device and turn it off to the patient but open to the atmosphere it's the same thing we neutralize the atmospheric pressure so that the zero of the monitor will be decided from this uh, atrial level uh, and from that point only the the pressure above that will be measured from the heart level that will be measured the ex this exert pressure on the transistor, this pressure is called zero. And zero once, once per shift, or if values are questionable, okay? Every shift we can zero, we should zero it and check the system whether the pressure is. And we should ensure the flash back at pump. We should, we should be kept at around 300. So I hope I'm not going too fast or is it, is it clear to, uh, to the person listening? I'm not getting back any feedback. I'll come to that later. Dr. Saha, I think uh, everything is going smoothly. Yeah, yeah. I'm not sure if I'm too fast, but I'm trying, trying to cover the basic points probably. We'll discuss them later. No, you are explaining the thing so nicely. That's why I have been interrupted. Okay, thank you. Thank you, sir. Please go ahead. Okay, so, sir, also, you. there are some comments in the chat box if you read. Yeah, we'll discuss that in the end probably. So zeroing is also important. I would like to emphasize one point. Okay, so this is important though. Uh, see, once you zero it in the heart point, this is the transistor point in, in the cardiac side, uh, heart side. So suppose I want to know about the circle of wheelies, the pressure level at the circle of wheelies well, that is needed for in, in, in some situations of head injury. Or, or central central nervous system disease or stroke or anything. If you want to know about the pressure inside the circle of Eulis, the transducer point has to be here, zeroing. So if, see, the point is that if we, in the distance from the heart, if, the, if it is 10 centimeter difference, it will change the pressure by 7.5 millimeter mercury. 
So suppose in the circular wheel is, and we are putting the transducer and we are thinking about the pressure level in the circular wheel is, the difference will be again 7.5 with 10 centimeter. You can calculate out the distance and every 10 centimeter, the difference will be 7.5. That's why if you see the MAP main arterial pressure, the circular wheel is will be 65. Uh, if we put the transistor at this level, but if you put the transistor at the cardiac level, as far as we de have decided that the transistor will see the central arterial pressure, then main arterial pressure will be seen in the circular wheel is level is 50. So, okay, fine. But if we put the transistor when the patient was in the lying state and patient has been put in the head up position and then probably pressed the difference is too much causing the mean arterial pressure here, actually in the circular wheel is, will be 20. Though the monitor will show you 65. This is extremely important in patients where probably head injury or a stroke patient where probably the actual pressure, mean arterial pressure inside the circular wheel is, is important. So if you want to measure that, probably for that moment, we'll zeroing it up to the high level and measure that area. This is also important from clinical point of view. Uh, not on that side, probably. I, want, I think I thought it's it's important to know also. Uh, then again, uh, yes. the I am interacting here about the circular wheel is. Yes, the only yes. one thing where basically we need to check the cerebral perfusion pressure rather than the yes. checking yes. the mean pressure. So mean pressure is important and the ICP pressure is also important in that case yes. where we are looking for any cerebral perfusion pressures. Yes, it's extremely important. Extremely yeah. important. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So in, in arterial pressure waveform and the aortic pressure, actually the systolic, the, if we see the, if we put the arterial line, what we'll be seeing in the monitor is like this. Okay, this is the repeat upstroke, systolic upstroke, then peak systolic pressure is B, then it will be descent, okay, C, systolic descent, then this will be diacrotic notes, this, this correlates with your um, aortic valve closure, then again it will be reflected, and then uh, diastolic runoff again coming back to the next wave okay this is this is the basic uh, uh, arterial waveform if we correlate this with uh, say what is mean arterial pressure again the whole area under this will be mean arterial pressure if we if we divide this maybe one third of the whole cardiac cycle will be systole and two third of the whole cycle will be diastole. That's why if we measure the, the mean arterial pressure, we measure one third of the systolic pressure and two third of the diastolic pressure, okay? So that is that is why probably we measure that way. So that the whole area is called mean arterial pressure. Why this is important, I'll come to that later. This is important because this is uh, not, this doesn't vary with the, with the system many a time. Again, if we compare with the ECG tracing, the, if, you, if you see the rapid upstroke comes about 180 milliseconds after the QRS complex. That means the electrical impulse come because all the tracings will be the, in the monitor. So if the QRS complex has started here, after 180 milliseconds, there will be rapid upstroke. The systolic upstroke will be there. So this is also important. The distance may increase or distance may decrease. May be decreased. So, uh, these diacrotic knots again, these diacrotic knots will be again, aortic valve will be closed. And which after the closure, there will be the backward pressure from the, uh, from the aorta, which will be reflected as a positive pressure, slight increase, and this will, this will come and diastolic runoff. Okay, that's clear. Suppose this is this limb becomes become a band one. This is called anacrotic limb, and this is called diacrotic limb. And this upstroke, how rapidly it rises, or how band this is also actually gives you some idea about the contractility of the heart. So if you go into the advanced cardiac monitoring, maybe the contractility again, so which is not the scope of this discussion again, not needed also. This angulation is also important, which is measured by advanced cardiac monitor. Stroke volume they measure from, the, from this systolic part. And with the heart rate, they give you cardiac, cardiac output. And then vascular resistance is measured, measured also from the diastolic part. And in advanced monitoring, again, if we have a pulse pressure variation, that is also you will come to discuss many a time 
in your clinical rounds and, and what is the pulse pressure variation we see the pulse pressure which is the uh, this this height level like if we go back here what is the pulse pressure again the whole length is different from this pulse pressure sorry this is the maximum pulse pressure and this is the minimum pulse pressure because if you see the height of this pulse pressure and this height of this pulse pressure is different if this variable is with the respiratory variation during inspiration you have a difference in the depth of this and expiration there may be a difference in this so this variation is actually measurable and which is measured and you give you a, a fair idea about uh, volume requirement is if pulse pressure varies in 12 percent maybe probably patient will be volume responsive so looking at the monitor without measuring also you can try this uh, one can try this and values also you can take uh, that is one aspect probably uh, the arterial waveform will help in deciding bedside so no, one thing uh, one thing uh, dr leka it is yes, yes, to understand yes. that is uh, there are uh, various ways that we measure the fluid responsiveness and this is yes, one yes. of the measurement that pulse pressure variations and yes, it will yes. normally vary in the inspiration and expiration and it is also important the spontaneous within patients and the patient who are on ventilator yes so these are the things that we need to remember whenever we are measuring the pulse pressure variations but it is need to know for all the nursing staff here that this pulse pressure variation is very important very very important to understand the fluid responsiveness whenever it is because this is a dynamic responsiveness dynamic yeah. response. yes, yes, yes. thank you sir yeah that is extremely important for other various so one one important aspects also i want to highlight here we are distal pulse amplification so if you think that the, if we put a catheter in the aorta so the pulse will be like this the diacrotic knots will come early because uh, the aortic valve is closer to aorta the farther down the artery, if you come to brachial artery, the diacrotic nodes will come down, radial artery, femoral artery, dorsal spedis. The diacrotic nodes will be distal. But remember, the height of the, the systolic curve will be higher. So this is called distal pulse amplification. The pulse, uh, the pressure, the height of the systolic pressure will be high. If you go more distally in the, in the, in the arterial pressure monitoring, if you put somewhere nearer aorta, the systolic pressure will be shown as low. Again, that is that depends upon the because the resistance will again increase, the wave will be amplified. This is because of oscillation. There are some physics involved, but for us, just to remember that more distally we go, more smaller arteries, more distal to the heart, the systolic level pressure will go high, the systolic will be lower. So again, damping. So that that comes to us as damping. Suppose this is the normal wave, and we have seen something like this. This is, there is no diacrotic nodes here. This has become flattened, and this under damp. This has become more sharp, and there are more diacroticness. This is important. Why this is over damp, and why this is, and this is called over damp. The whole uh, waveform has been damped overly, and this is under damp. That is the whole uh, waveform has been amplified here. So what happens in under them is if we will show a low uh, uh, falsely actually low systolic blood pressure. As you have seen, the systolic blood pressure will be low. The diastolic blood pressure will be shown as high. But again, if you see the mean arterial pressure, like one third of the systolic blood pressure, two third of the diastolic blood pressure, mean arterial pressure will be unaffected. So even if over damp, if you observe the mean arterial pressure, that will not be changed. That, that's the advantage of having arterial line actually over, over NIVB. Again, uh, this is under damp again. It will show falsely high, uh, high systolic blood pressure and there will be low diastolic pressure. Again, mean arterial pressure will be unaffected because we are taking one third of the systolic and two third of the diastolic. So it will nullify the variability. So this under damp and over damp, uh, should, uh, just remember that over damp is this is being suppressed. And over under damping, the suppression is lost. That's why the, the amplification is extremely high. So why this? Have, how to see that whether this is under damp or over damp is called a square wave test. This is important to remember. Also called flash, first flash. Uh, okay, sorry, first flash test. We give a first flash uh, to the system to see that the system is working normally. So if we what how we do again we remember. 
if you see this, this is to monitor, and this is upside down, this is to catheter, the arterial catheter will be here, and this is top cough. This is flush valve again, and the, the pressure bag will be here. That means three, uh, the 500 ml of normal saline is here under 300 millimeter mercury pressure. So what is done actually, this will is close to the catheter, to the patient side it will be closed, and then open the flask, the whole system will be exposed to this 300 milliliter market. Why 300? Because see, the, the arterial pressure may go up to 20, 230, 240 also. That's why, that's why we keep it around 300, so that we don't miss that. So we put the whole system at 300 and see the system. So when we put the, when we, uh, put the stop off to this, that means to the patient it will be closed. We open this flask. The 300 pressure, 300 millimeter mercury pressure will be will expose the system. The whole cell line will be flushed here, and the monitor will take the pressure. What what will be seen again, like this one? We 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 allow the pressure to rise up to 300 millimeter mercury. Keep it for some time and then close it. It will come down zero. Okay. So this should. What will happen if the normal? If you go to the normal one, you come to the normal one. It will go like this. We'll keep it flask and then close the valve, close this yellow again, yellow channel, and it will come down again to this. And the jar will be this oscillation should be one or two. Okay. See, this is 300 millimeter mercury. Up to 300 millimeter mercury, the pressure, the system is exposed. Keep it there for some time. Then it will come down one or two oscillation. This is normal. That means the system is normal. The values we will be getting is normal. Suppose you are seeing seeing something like this flatten or over dam, and we have done the flush test, and this will be there will be no oscillation. There is no diacritic noise. That means this is actually over dam. Over dam happens when the air bubbles are in the system or a patient is overly compliant a distensible tubing. Tubing is very distensible, not very rigid one. A catheter is king, there is clot inside the system or there may be clot in the, in the arterial system. Low flush back, back pressure. If the back pressure is uh, having less pressure, no fluid in the flush back. No one check probably in the back that there is no fluid inside the back. Improper scaling and severe hypertension. Severe hypertension if everything is uh, excluded. So that is extremely dangerous. The other thing is that we have done the flask test and the oscillation is too much. That means it is, it is, it is under dam. Under dam can happen if the tubing is long. That means the, the oscillation is augmented and it will show constantly high blood pressure. Actual blood pressure is low, but the monitor is showing high breast blood pressure. That is also extremely risky. This is, this is because of long tubing, overly stiff and non-compliant tubing. Increased vascular resistance also causes the same thing. And reverberation and tubing causing harmonic. That risk, the, again, the vibration also may cause the same abnormality. So uh, almost coming to the last part, actually, though I'm taking longer time, uh, assess, uh, the routine assessment and monitoring is important. Assess waveform and troubleshoot dampened waveform. So you must observe dampened waveform every time. Inspect insertion sign area and surrounding. Inspect resting integrity and palpate gel pad to access for bogginess if there is collection, bleeding, or any, any infection you can suspect. Confirm accuracy of all infection. Assess distal extremity for color, circulation, motion, and swelling. If there is in arterial line specifically, if distal ischemia is there, color change will be there, the edema will be there. So we must immediately inform the doctor and line should be removed as early as possible so so that the ischemic damage to the limb doesn't happen. Keep dressing exposed uh, or minimize the amount of linen. So hands should be exposed. You should not keep the hand inside linen and one is seeing the uh, even transparent dressing. Keep arterial line alarms on and you should set alarm extremely important. You should not ignore our arterial line alarm. Review the ongoing need for arterial line. Once you know that person's blood pressure is stable, is off vasopressor or maybe very the vasopressor dose you are reducing and, and low dose of vasopressor you should remove the artery line as soon as possible and once the central venous line need is off then you should remove these lines as, as early as possible that is extremely important the positional artery line the colonization contamination of peripheral and arterial catheter inadequate line anchoring with catheter movement inadequate flushing 
and thrombosis are all important risk factor for central venous bloodstream infection. And once the patient develops CRBSI, sepsis, and SOC, again the patient will go into the pretty bad shape. And the second second hit will be more difficult, and patient may not survive. Patient is already exhausted from the first disease itself. The dressing sense frequency we have already discussed sends all transparent arterial and central venous line dressing every seven days for transparent. Mind that. If you use gauze dressing, then every 48 hours maybe, or maybe daily. Sends dressing if, if the, this feels boggy or to touch or significantly swollen, then probably you change. Gauze dressings should be almost daily or maybe alternate day. If using tap or gauze on central arterial line, dressing should be changed daily. Since any dressing that has loosened or lost its occlusive properties. If you think that this is not being maintained properly, you should remove this. Any catheter inserted under emergency situation with possible breach in asepsis should be replaced as soon as possible. Because, because once the patient is a little bit stable, you, you can remove the femoral line placed in emergency department and uh, because the signs of infection, then asepsis, asepsis part, you are not sure that how they, they gave that time. Probably you'll, you'll change and put in a different site, maybe a jugular or, or maybe a subclavian line so that the infection rates are low and, and the consequences of CRBSI release. It's preferable not to leave femoral catheters in place for longer than five days due to high risk of infection and now no longer than seven days for other sites. These are also recommendations. Some the disposable, uh, sorry, disposable reusable transistors are replaced at 96 hours interval. The associated TV, these are all again, again uh, the guidelines people are following uh, four days or five days. The removal of A line, arterial line is also important. Bleeding rings, rings should be assessed. Need for extended compression again should be assessed. And aseptic techniques are again, we'll have to maintain the aseptic techniques. Proper uh, hand washing, gloves, gown, and all the, all the steps uh, should be followed again very strictly. Pressure to be apply, applied. Pressure to be applied, uh, like radial artery for five minutes, for femoral artery ten minutes. But if coagulopathy is suspected, double the time. And suppose after that that time, if if uh, they are still losing, probably will will extend by five minutes every five minutes. And remove catheter. This is extremely important. All the remove catheters should be inspected. Tips should be inspected. Suppose if it is, if it is uh, the, the part of the tip is missing, then it's an emergency. You should call a vascular surgeon immediately. And you should, in arterial line, you should keep a pressure a distal to the artery for some time and look for ischemia in the distal because it will cause distal embolization of that part of the catheter, causing damage to the limb. So this part, a nursing staff or or a doctor on duty uh, should be very, very vigilant. So removing arterial line is also, or venous, central venous catheter is also extremely important. And the how, what was to be said. I think that ends my uh, uh, my talk, actually, discussion about I have touched the important points. Uh, I have missed many important points, probably, because it's extremely oh, you difficult. Have, <laughs> no, you, have, you have almost... Because we got a lot of responses from the participants. They are very happy that the explanation is absolutely clear. They have also understood the things. Uh, the only one thing that we need to touch, but the time is not there, is basically the infection, the catheter bundle care, though it is not, uh, uh, it's beyond the uh, scope for this uh, discussion. So uh, we need to be careful about uh, uh, the CLBSI and uh, we need to be very careful about managing the central venous catheter. Okay. So the infection related to the arterial is not really very high, but the central venous catheter is the line higher. Yes. We might put into the patients into the more more severe or the secondary infections. So you have a question, right? So yeah, we have already 92 participants are already there. So yeah, Dr. Okay. Lehner, you need to put the questions. Yeah. I can uh, unshare my slide, I think. Stop sharing slide. Yeah. Okay. So I would request anyone, anyone if there is any, any uh, concern about or any uh, comment or anything that you please raise your hand so that we can unmute you and you can discuss with us. We are all here.
so one thing is very important about that lawker has already been told and discussed very nicely and clearly about the dumping of uh, the arterial line we need to be assess and read the uh, arterial blood pressures very carefully and we need to be do the zeroing every time before changing of our vessel pressures please do not change the vessel pressures without uh, calibrating your systems so it may be wrong and it may be misguide the whole situations so these are few take homes that are very important for us and the understanding of the arterial blood pressure especially the uh, the card is very important because many a times we have seen that the patient was hypotensive and uh, the patient is already on three vessel pressures they are really uh, having some problem in the patient especially there are many patients who are elderly having a very much atherosclerotic vessels so be careful about uh, these all these type of patients where we might be misdetected with the uh, arterial blood patients so i think uh, yeah we shall have yeah yes sir good, very good evening sir yeah good evening uh, so i have two question about arterial line only so in terms do you sir uh, that uh, will be uh, mostly we'll be using only 500 ml and uh, we and uh, we used to keep 300 ml mg uh, that uh, pressure back right uh, yes. so suppose uh, suppose if i connected uh, 1000 ml and so whether same pressure can be pr uh, provide or uh, yeah yeah pressure pressure, yeah. pressure is more important you have to put the same 300 pressure why why we need 300 ml mercury pressure is your blood pressure level suppose a hypertensive patient how much high pressure your systolic blood pressure it can go up to 240 260 many patients we get around 240 by 120 blood pressures so we make it a arbitrary 300 okay so and that, that is the maximum probably we can go so up to that level you put whether you put 500 ml plus test you you 500 ml means you you there is a lot of fluid there in 500 you you can put 1000 ml but you have to maintain that pressure at, at again Uh, 300 milliliter mercury. The so bag, the bag will be difficult. But I think the bag which will compress the 1000 ml bag uh, will be difficult. I am not sure whether the 1000 ml bag will fit into that compressive, which will actually give you 300 milliliter mercury. I am not sure about that. Let's check that. Okay, sir. Sure. And one more thing, sir, that uh, we'll be using the Baxter kit. The tubing will be the long. So whether the, the uh, whatever the blood pressure is showing in the monitor, that blood pressure will be the correct. The tubing means the stiff tubing should be short and stiff. Okay, the the tubing should be. Why the tubing should be stiff and short is the oscillation inside the artery should be should not be modified to the monitor. Okay, so if you have a long tube. and it will be dampened again the the oscillation which will be reflected into the electrical uh, impulse will be changed if you have a elastic tube and a long tube the both will change the change the level of the blood pressure this may not give you accurate reading okay yeah any other Yeah. but still 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 you can you can confirm these things with the with the product manufacturer they have got their guideline and and, and this uh, the points to discuss so you can discuss with the product no basically the uh, you are absolutely uh, have pointed out rightly that the things uh, the uh, stiffness and the length need to be fixed because it should not be changed otherwise the whole purpose of making uh, using this transducer is to transfer from the mechanical waveform to a electrical waveform so right so if there is any change of the systems so it will ultimately be not rightly manifested or transfer into a electrical activities so that is very important so the the system which is available as a ready made please do use that do not use something else which which can be used uh, in other areas